Welcome all sports fans, YouTubers, and Facebookers all across the nation. This is An Educated Sports Talk, presented by An Educated Network. I'm your host, Carlos Clayton. We have big news today. First off, we're going to start off with our top 100 NFL players list. We are doing 40 through 31, so we'll talk about the players 40 through 31. And we have a couple summer league news and uh, no breakdowns of what's going on. And we have a very interesting signing from free agency. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But let's go ahead and get to the top 100 NFL players list. And we're at 40 through 31. So at number 40, but before we get started, this particular 10 players is kind of baffling uh in, in, in my opinion some things are kind of kooky we'll talk about that in just a second so let, let's go with it number 40 it is Vic Beasley the linebacker from the Atlanta Falcons and uh, he led the league in sacks 15.5 or, or 15 and a half sacks uh, this season he was a force he was a force but that's a product of his environment as well Atlanta basically brings it with that defense they they, they bring it all the time and you know, you got to understand that Vic started off poor. Let's just say not, not bad, but he started off very poor this first couple years in the league. And now he's kind of feeling himself. And do I think he's ranked a little high? I do. It's just one year, but it's, 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 it's to the peers. It's what the peers think. And his peers think that he is one of the top rushers. And he is because he did lead the league in sacks. But it's just one year. you got to kind of show me more. Show me you can do it next year as well. And I think he will do it next year. But I'm more of a prove it to me to where I can put you that high. I would have picked him somewhere in the 70s, uh, maybe the 60s, in my opinion. But 40, I think, is a little too high. But he does deserve to be in the list nonetheless. 15 and a half sacks is no slouch at all. At number 39, Bobby Wagner, the linebacker for the Seattle Seahawks. I keep telling everybody, Bobby Wagner, I mean, the, the Seahawks have just Pro Bowl caliber players on every level in that defense, from the D tackles, from the linebackers, the uh, DNs, to safeties, cornerbacks. They have it all, man. That defense is stout. And um, Bobby Wagner is no stop. He is the leader of that linebacking core. Uh, he led the league in total tackles with 167. I mean, he is always on point. It doesn't matter. He's a great run stopper, and he's great in zone as well. He's just one of those guys, he, he doesn't miss tackles. And when you're a linebacker, and you lead the league in tackles, that means that means you're stopping people from getting plus yardage. It's, it's, it's always bad news when your cornerbacks or your safeties, basically your safeties, have the most tackles on your team. That means that uh, running backs or receivers are getting past um, you know, that, that line of scrimmage to where you know, uh, they have a breakaway catch or something, breakaway yardage, something like that. So it, it lets you know that he doesn't miss tackles, Bobby Wagner. So he is number 39 on that list. Number 38, Fletcher Cox, defensive tackle for the Philadelphia Eagles. Six and a half sacks this year. He's made a Pro Bowl two years in a row now. Eagles defense, like I said, was stout all year. Their offense just couldn't catch up with what the defense brought. So the, NFC, the whole NFC East, defensively wise as a, as a unit, some good success. Outside of maybe Washington, maybe Dallas, but for sure, you know, the Giants and the Eagles are going to bring it. And you see that uh, Cox is basically a, a he is the big presence for them because he brings it every down and he's he's a, a he's a veteran veterans guy so he comes in every day works hard and you know that he's going to bring it every game. Number thirty seven, Aki Talib. This is my dude right here. No matter how people think about his antics and he he is kind of a crazy person you know, in and outside of the field. But when you're a cornerback, I always say it. I'm, I'm gonna stay saying it. Cornerback is the hardest job in the NFL in this past happy league the defense is built on being slammed by the offense cornerbacks have the hardest time I'm telling you guys you gotta have swag gotta have some sort of attitude as a cornerback to make it in this league a key to leave has that attitude he has that swag I mean Pro Bowl four straight years in a row he just brings it he's elite man-to-man -man defender one of the best in the league and uh, I admire a key to leave on the field doing what he got to do uh, number 36, kind of a newcomer, Tyreek Hill. I mean, this guy here, Kansas City had no weapons. Well, they have one now. Uh, in the past, Kansas City was kind of a dud offense, but Tyreek Hill is explosive in every facet of the game, whether it's kick return, punt return, receiving, or rushing. He, uh, he has at least three touchdowns in each of those categories, which breaks the NFL record. Uh, 
three touchdowns or more in receiving, rushing, and kick return slash punt return. So that guy is freaking good. Um, so Tyreek Hill is number 36. 35. This is the head scratch right here. J.J. Watt. Defensive end, D tackle, whatever you want to call him, nose guard, whatever you want to call him for the Texans because he does it all. This guy is, in my opinion, the best defensive player. Okay, yes, he missed a whole entire year. I understand that. He missed a whole year. And he goes from basically number one to number 35 for missing the whole year? I don't care. J.D. Watts on one leg is better than most NFL players out there. So that was kind of my head scratcher because you, you understand that it's Pierce. So you know that just a year ago he was the best player. So he's missed one year in his career. Now he's on with 35. I don't get that. J.D. Watts deserves better than that. But this guy is a monster. He is my favorite defensive player uh, in the NFL. I, I Look, I don't really look at the defense very, very much when I'm watching the football game, but when the Texans are playing, and I am from uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana, so I get Saints games and I get Texans games as well. So I watch a lot of Texans games when it's kind of important. And I love watching J.J. Watts. I see where he's lined up at, and I'm, I'm, I'm like, ooh, what is he gonna do next? Is it a bull rush? Is it a spin move? Is it a, uh, you know, a uh, swim move? Is, what, what is what, what he's gonna do? Because the man is a beast, man. and. Uh, no, he missed last season. That's it. He still, he, when he comes back, he's going to be dominant all over again. So I'm just kind of a head scratcher why he's 35. At 34, Cam Chancellor, the safety from the Seattle Seahawks. The guy's like 6'9". Okay, he's not that tall, but he's a very tall dude. And he is a freaking beast. Another Seahawk defensive player on this list. Like I said, their level, they have Pro Bowl caliber players on each freaking level. That being said, Cam Chancellor, he did miss four games this year, but it did not matter. When he played, he played lights out. No one was getting on him. I mean, he's basically second in the league in uh, you know, uh, opponent's reception, uh, re receiving percentage or uh, catch percentage because he shuts him down. He, he's so freaking tall and athletic. It's, it's amazing uh, how he is. So Cam Chancellor is number 34. Number 33, DeMarco Murray, running back for the Tennessee Titans. 1,287 yards rushing. You thought that him leaving from Dallas and playing with this team, you thought he was going to have some kind of decline. And I was one of those guys who was saying, well, Dallas makes everyone look better. Well, let's give credit where credit is due. DeMarco Murray made sure that people remember who he is because he had a, another great year with that Tennessee Titans uh, team. And they are a run-oriented team. I understand that because they had to be. Marcus Murray doesn't have any weapons to throw to. DeMarco Murray made up for that, and he had a big, big, big season, almost 300 yards. He was third in the league in rushing this year, but he dominated a lot of games. And, you know, I'm happy for DeMarco Murray to, uh, to actually look good in this season, you know. Not everyone's saying, well, it was Dallas that made you look good. No, he went out there and proved that it was, it was himself. It was Dallas, a little bit of Dallas, but it's himself as well. So, DeMarco Murray, number 33 on the top 100 NFL players list. Number 32. Marcus Peters, cornerback from the Kansas City Chiefs, another, you know, he, he doesn't have a lot of swag, but he just plays the game right. And I like a guy who takes chances. When you're a cornerback, sometimes you got to gamble, baby, you do. And he gambles a lot. He, uh, since 2015, he leads the NFL in 14 interceptions. So you know he does a lot of gambling. He gets beat a lot as well. So sometimes you got to pick your poison. But boy, when he picks right, it's going to the house or it's going for big yardage. So Marcus Peters, number uh, number 32 on the top 100 list. Um, and I, I, I love his, no, I'm not going to say swag, but his demeanor. His, his, I want to make a big play every game or every day, every play. And that's great for defense. It's not so great when you're on offense want to make a big play. But when you're on defense, you want to make a big play, you know, that, that's a great mentality to have. Marcus Peters is that guy. And the last one uh, from 40 to 31, we had number 31, Matthew Stafford, quarterback for the Detroit Lions. I think 31 is a little high for me. I'm not the biggest Matthew Stafford fan. He takes a lot of risk. I just been saying, well, you, you can't gamble as much on offense. He gambles a lot. He has some of that, that Brett Favre gunslinging mentality, just throw it in there. But he makes a lot of bad decisions. Yes, 
4,327 yards of uh, passing is nothing to laugh at. That is outstanding numbers, but at the end of the day, it's all about your decision making. I thought there was a lot of quarterbacks I, I would have probably put, uh, I don't know who's up there, but I'm not going to disrespect them and say Philip Rivers, I won't say that, but there's some other quarterbacks on this list that, that should have been, went before him. I think Marcus Mariota should have went. Uh, higher than Matthew Stafford in my opinion but Matthew Stafford is a veteran he's been there he's done that he's gone to playoff games but I just think that he doesn't you know, in, in big moments he doesn't show up to me in big moments and I'm talking playoff moments I'm talking games to get in the playoffs that kind of stuff so uh, but like I said he is number 31 so that's that's the, the top list for 40 to 31 just to do a quick recap number 40 Vic Beasley the uh, linebacker from the Falcons 39, Bobby Wagner, linebacker for the Seahawks. 38, Fletcher Cox, defensive tackle for the Eagles. At 37, Akeem Tlaib, cornerback for the Denver Broncos. 36, Tyreek Hill, you can call him pump return slash wide receiver slash running back for the Kansas City Chiefs. 35, my man J.J. Watts, DND tackle, nose guard for the Texans, where they're going to call him. 35, Cam Chancellor, safety for the Seahawks. Number 33, DeMarco Murray, Running back for the Tennessee Titans at 32, Marcus Peters, cornerback for the Kansas City Chiefs, and at 31, Matthew Stafford, quarterback for the Detroit Lions. So that's 40 to 31. Next video, we'll talk about numbers 30 through 21, and that's when things get very interesting. But, so stay tuned for that episode. Now, we're getting on to NBA news, and we have NBA Summer League coming in, where the guys who got drafted and guys who didn't get drafted come on to play about you know, eight, nine, ten games in the summer and the respective teams and try and make the team. Some will make the team automatically and some are trying to get the last roster on the, uh, the team. So, with that being said, here we go. Everyone's talking about it. The man, the myth, the legend, Lonzo Ball. I'm recapping his first two games, the only two games he's played. First game against the, uh, the Clippers. Talk about horrible to start off a pro career, when I call it a pro career, it's summer league still. Two, uh, five points, excuse me, two for 11 from the field. I mean, two for 15, one for 11 from three point land, five assists, four turnovers. The man did not look good. And for a quick second, I was like, whoa, this might be bad news. And then that next second, I was like, hold up, pump your brakes. Is this the first game of Summer League, Summer League, and I saw I saw the game. A lot of his shots went in and out, or they're close. Game is about basketball is about make or miss, and what he was doing was shooting a lot. That's not his style. He's more of the facilitator. That being said, I I, I said give it time, give it time, and let him relax because he has a lot of pressure. He could thank his dad, he could thank himself, he could thank the ball family. He has a lot of pressure on himself, but. We're not going to blow it out of proportion. The media will do that, but on this show, I'm not. And I told everyone, yes, he had a bad game, but it's the first, first, you know, game of the summer league. Let's see how he progresses on. Then if he keeps it up for the eight, nine, ten games they play in summer league, then we can talk about him. What he does in the second game, triple, double. Already, triple, double. Not the biggest triple, double. 11 points, 11 rebounds, 11 assists, and they played against Boston Celtics, but... With that being said, it showed his mentality. I mean, this is a summer league game. I can't remember the last person who had a triple-double, and if he did, it wasn't talked about because it wasn't Lonzo Ball. But in a summer league game to have a triple-double in points, rebounds, and assists, that's crazy. That's crazy. Only a few guys can do that, and Lonzo's going to make this Lakers team better. He will. No doubt about that. You saw from the first play of the first game he played, Ali to Brennan Ingram. What that was like, whoa, crowd was into it. Then you get into this game in here, and he just he had the crowd dazzling. That's what Lonzo's going to do. Everyone's waiting to see what he would do for that second game. And he showed up and showed out. Now, they, they wound up still losing against um, the... Uh, whoa, that was not good, y'all. That's not good, y'all. My bad. I mean, that's just... You know, it's time for a camera, right? <laughs> but... He loses, uh, he doesn't lose his composure, he keeps it real, and 11 points, 11 rebounds, 11 assists, there's nothing to sneeze at, nothing to laugh about, the man is for real. 
So I'm happy to see that. Now his counterpart that he played against, I think, did Boston get a gym? Now, like I said, it's summer league, so we can't just go crazy on the first couple games. We can't do that, because if you do that, then, well, <laughs> you know, you, you might look stupid. But Jason Tatum, as of right now, he's looking like he's the best player out of this draft. In this particular game against uh, the Lakers, he had 27 points and 11 rebounds. And his first game against Sixers, he, he looked good too. So Jason Tatum's looking like the man. Markel Fultz, pretty good game uh, as well. Uh, he just recently uh, left with a sprained ankle. Now, obviously, I know it's not serious. It's not serious at all, but they want to take precaution. I mean, it's just summer league, so they want to take precaution of their number one overall pick. And it's, it's, it's showing right now that these guys, this draft class, is very talented, like we thought it would be. It looks, it looks like everything we thought of because De'Aaron Fox, first game, 18 points. Um, we have uh, Josh Jackson, first game, 18 points. And those guys look good. They look like they're ready for the challenge. And I'm excited about this, you know, this draft class and this upcoming year with these rookies coming in and dominating. They're dominating headlines, dominating the court as well. So Lonzo comes out with a dud that was automatic. Everyone was going to talk about that. Then he comes out in the second game, poses a triple-double. So, you know, with that being said, it's going to be really, really fun. Now, the Summer League, there's more than just those teams, obviously. Yeah, all 30 teams come on in and play, and then you have your playoffs. I don't know how the playoffs are set up, but hopefully we see more of these guys at least 12, 13 games, I'm crossing my fingers to see these guys play a lot more because after that you have a few months and some training camp starts in like September or something like that. So, uh, on to one of the <laughs> one of the weirdest news, strangest news. So, Jamal Crawford was traded from the Clippers to the Hawks in like a three-team trade. Well, the Hawks waived them. Jamal Crawford graciously thanked him. Thank you guys for waving me because we all knew he was getting waved. We all knew that. And I do apologize for the technical difficulty that my phone fell. I slammed it at the table. So, sorry about that. It just happens. This is reality TV. We're live. Not really, but this is YouTube. <laughs> so, I keep it going. No edits right now. Not yet. But, Jamal Crawford, tra traded from the Clippers, goes to Atlanta. Atlanta waves him. Everyone and their mama, including myself, are saying Jamal Crawford is going to the Cavaliers, right? That's the place where he's got to go to. That's the place where he fits the most with LeBron James. And, you know, you should want to go there because the Cavaliers want you just as bad. What happens? The Minnesota freaking Timberwolves pick up Jamal Crawford. I believe a two-year deal. I don't know the, the, the money-wise, but I know it was a two-year deal, something like that. And it got me thinking, is Minnesota really trying to be for real? Tom Thibodeau, after losing out and not making the playoffs, probably for the first time in his head coach career, he said, F that, I'm changing everything. I don't know if it's more about Minnesota or is it less about Cleveland. That's the thing. Nobody wants to go to Cleveland. I don't get it. it, 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 it now, I know the city, but, but it's also Minnesota. He picked Minnesota. You picked Minnesota, which I believe is colder than Cleveland, with less things to do than Cleveland. He picks Minnesota over Cleveland. That was, that was crazy in my opinion. I thought, there's, there's no way that he doesn't go to Cleveland. And if he does go to, say, uh, you know, a contending team down south where it's all good, whether Miami or California, somewhere like that in that area, you would think that, okay, you understand weather-wise. No, he goes to Minnesota where it's freaking cold out there, but they have something going on. And I don't know what Tom Thibodeau sold on him or told him, but basically Jamal Crawford believed in it. And he believes in what Tom Thibodeau and his Minnesota Timberwolves team is doing. You look at the squad now, and you're like, that's got to be playoffs, man. That, that's that's got to be playoffs. And and then you see the you know, teams like the Sacramento Kings, like adding pieces to it. They might not make the playoffs, but they're trying to get in there. And Cleveland is stuck like, we just want to be one team. We just want to be one team. The Warriors, we just want to beat them. Can we get some help, please? And players are not going to Cleveland. I think it's just, it's got to be, whether it's the city, whether it's the future, that's not so bright if, in Cleveland. I don't know, but teams don't want to go to Cleveland. I don't know what it is, but Jamal Crawford chooses Minnesota. Over Cleveland, which gets me worrying about 
the state of Cleveland, whether it's their front management, they have no general manager right now, whether it's LeBron might be leaving after next year, whether it's they just can't beat the Warriors, so let's try and beat the Warriors in the West instead of, I don't know, I don't know. But whatever it is, Minnesota has something going on, and Jamal Crawford believes in that system, so that it is what it is for them. So Jamal Crawford's in Minnesota Timberwolf, and Cleveland is still wondering who the hell can we get besides Jose Calderon and Jeff Green. <laughs> wow. Good job, Cleveland. Good job. Um, so... Next episode, I, you know, well, let's talk about the biggest winners and the losers right now. I think for the whole entire offseason right now, the biggest winner has to be, in my opinion, the Boston Celtics. Boston, man, they got their go-to guy in Gordon Hayward. They got the uh, number three pick, the guy they still wanted in Jason Tatum. Uh, they they got a good thing going. You still have draft picks galore. You might be able to finesse a Marc Gasol. I don't know. That that right there, I'm like, this team right here is looking good. Another team, Sacramento Kings. They are changing their culture. That's another winner. They, they change it by, by adding Zach Randolph, George Hill, and a Vince Carter. You give your young guys better presence now. So that changes the culture right there. You might not win anything, but I like the fact that they are actually getting guys to come in here and changing the culture around, changing how to be professional because they're tired of having clowns. I'm talking to you, DeMarcus Cousins. They're, talk, they're tired of having clowns in their system, and I don't blame them on that. And then now you talk about the biggest losers. <laughs> I'm sorry. I hate to keep up with them, but I think the Cleveland Cavaliers are one of the biggest losers right now. Um... If not the biggest loser in this free agency, just because they they dug themselves a gigantic hole, and they're trying so hard to get somebody somewhere to fit with this team, but they don't have the money, they don't have the cap space, they don't have the you know, they just don't have it. And it's, it's funny because people should be lining up playing in Cleveland because there's no competition outside of maybe Boston. I don't see why people aren't trying to jump on that bandwagon, but. Cleveland, it might, be, it might just be the city itself that nobody wants to go to. Right now, they're losing this free agent battle because they already expressed how badly they wanted to, uh, you know, get people. They're talking Carmelo. They talked Paul George. They, you know, they talked all kind of people. And then you get Jose Calderon and Jeff Green. That's not going to cut it out if you're a Cleveland Cavaliers fan. You're saying we just want to beat one team, the Golden State Warriors. So, uh... But after that, I think the Boston Celtics are the biggest winners and the Cleveland Cavaliers are the biggest losers. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Just free agency because I think Cleveland is still a better team than Boston. So, that's my opinion on everything. Please check out Uneducated Network. We have a couple shows on there already. Got a couple more new shows. Be on the lookout for that. It's going to be incredible. I'm ready for that. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Get your mama, uncle, daddy, sister, brother, everybody, auntie. Nanny, Paran, anyone on Uneducated Network, subscribe to that. Subscribe to Uneducated Sports Talk as well. That is my show and everybody else's show as well. So please, please do all that. And, uh, you know, like I said, next episode we'll talk about uh, top uh, 31 through 30 through 21 in the NFL. And we'll talk more NBA news, of course, is going down. So check me out next episode. Like, subscribe, check me out on Facebook. My name is Carlos Clayton. I am from Lake Charles, Louisiana. If that helps, check me out on Twitter, at Carlos Clayton. I repeat, at Carlos Clayton. And uh, that's all for today, y'all. So, uh, until next time, like I said, like, subscribe, check me out. So I can really say, man. So as always, sports fans, stay smart, stay educated. Peace. <laughs>